In a bold move by Australia's big four banks, we are again reminded how this oligopoly is no longer needed in the world of finance and why crypto is the future of everything money. G'day viewers, I'm Adam Stokes. Welcome back to the channel where as always a free and easy way of supporting this work is by simply hitting that like button, subscribing if you're new, ensuring you hit that notification bell so you never miss a new episode. Also watch out for the bots. I will never ask you to contact me via WhatsApp or Telegram. They are scammers. Stay away. Let's explore this article from the good people at news.com.au where we can see bank branch closures are having a devastating impact with the new data showing almost 459 branches have been shut down in the last few years while thousands of ATMs were also removed. After the last three years, around 3,800 ATMs were taken out of circulation representing more than a third of all existing cash machines in the country. Let me say that again. More than a third of all existing cash machines have been taken out of the country. At the same time, the big four banks, which are CBA, Westpac, ANZ and NAB, permanently closed the doors of 459 of their branches, according to the data obtained by the Daily Telegraph. New South Wales was the hardest hit state, losing 140 bank stores during that period. Of those, 20 were shut down in Sydney and the rest were closed across smaller cities and regional areas in the state. The shutdowns left nearly 300 New South Wales suburbs without a branch to visit and 216 suburbs have been left with no way to procure cash after the closure of ATMs in the area. Victoria didn't fare much better losing 120 branches which left thousands with nowhere to go. So let's break away from the article for a bit and head over to KPMG and look at how much money these banks are making. As we can see from this report from a very respectable source, KPMG, Australian major banks have reported a combined cash profit after tax from continuing operations, and this is after tax, of $26.8 billion, up 54.7%. So there's no need for me to read this report other than their profits are up over 54.7% and they're clearing $26.8 billion. Now for my international viewers, of course, we're speaking in Australian dollars, but that's still around the 20 billion US dollars per annum. And we mentioned the big four banks in Australia because although they can't officially be recognized as operating as a cartel or an oligopoly, which is always a fun word to say, the reality is they kind of do operate as an oligopoly. For example, we can see when there are interest rate hikes, they always take turns in who's going to be the bad guy first. That is, one of the banks has to break out and put the interest rates up first. And if you watch the pattern over many years of the banks raising rates, they take it in turns of who goes first. Is that a chance or a coincidence? Now, another thing to consider is, although their profits are up so much in the billions of dollars, they're pulling back access to their product. Now, I don't really blame the banks for doing this. They are about profits. They have a freedom to print money. I do have a problem with that issue, but if you had a freedom to print money through fractional reserve lending, you'd probably take it as well. The video I'm making today is about why banks are no longer needed, because they're demonstrating to us collectively that they are no longer needed and the digital space is already here. Even when they can afford to offer an in-person customer service experience, they don't. And the reason why they don't is because people are comfortable using the digital space. Sure, there are outliers, particularly with our elderly population who want to access these in-person services. The rest of us are very much comfortable using the digital space. And as we go back to this article, you'll see that the data supports this. And the purpose of my video today is to say, why are we even using banks? I can access money in every single way that the banks are currently offering, yet I can do it cheaper faster and with more profits. That is more profits to myself. Noting that they're making $26.8 billion in profits, yet they're only returning to the savings accounts 0.001%, maybe a tenth of a percent if you're lucky, or if you're a high roller, you may get 1%, which doesn't even come close to anywhere near inflation. Meanwhile, they are printing money out of thin air through fractional reserve lending. Yet when we go into the digital financial space, I can comfortably earn 9% on a stable coin. 9%. And I can do it without leaving home. And I can do it 24 hours a day, seven days a week without interacting with these massive financial institutions who are diluting the value of everyone's money through inflation. 
Remember, every time you get a home loan, whether it's for a house that you live in or for an investment property, the money that you obtain from the bank is diluting everyone's money. You borrow $100,000 as an example, the bank has only got $10,000 that they need in reserves, sometimes only $5,000 that they need in reserves, and the remaining ninety dollars or $95,000 is printed out of thin air. You pay back real value through your real time, your real effort, your real energy for fake money that they never had in the first place. Moreover, whilst you're doing this, you're diluting the value of everyone's holdings, whether that be cash holdings, superannuation holdings, or the nominal value of the property itself. Every time any Australian anywhere, and this goes outside Australia as well, every time they get a bank loan through fractional reserve lending, the banks make more money, you have to pay back money that never existed, and you're diluting the holdings of everyone's money, including your own and your family's, through the absolutely absurd reality of fractional reserve lending. Going back to the article, in a statement from Finance Sector Union National Secretary Julia Angrisano, she says, closures have a devastating impact on local communities. Jobs are lost, business is impacted, and another local service disappears. The closures are particularly bad news for regional and rural areas and older citizens, according to Ms Angrisano. There needs to be a better assessment of community needs before a branch is closed, she added. If banks are now essential services, then perhaps we should look at how they can be regulated like other essential services. Now that is a very good point there as we break away from the article. Banks are essential services, yet the exposure to these banks is becoming more and more difficult whilst their profits go further and further upwards. So we need to really assess as a community, as a society, how this is impacting on all of us and if this industry is really needed. So we can see the banks are making a lot of money, We can see they're outsourcing a lot of their work to the digital space. We can see that it's an essential service, yet we can access it less and less. Most importantly, the banks have this legal ability, this freedom, this given right, if you will, from the government to print money out of thin air. Compare the banking business model to any other industry in the world, any industry. Let's go very simple. Let's say a cafe. A cafe is making about 2 to 5% profit, maybe 10, depending how they're operating, what rent they're paying. They are producing real value with real labor, real supplies to real customers in person, and they work very hard to make that profit. Can you imagine the cafe could essentially make 100 times the profit by not even opening its front door, by producing coffee that they never had in the first place, demanding their customer to pay for a product that they never even held in their possession. Roll with me on this example. When you lend out money, they're lending you a product, a commodity, a stock, an asset that they don't even have in the first place. And then you have to pay it back with real money, real value, real effort. Meanwhile, they're reducing the access to their shop fronts whilst the government and themselves define them as an essential service. From a financial standpoint, it is in a bank's interest to close down as many branches as possible, Ms. Angrisano pointed out. She says, the traditional banks are facing more and more competition from new entrants such as digital banks, non-bank lenders, and buy now, pay later services, and to stay profitable, they will reduce their biggest costs, which are wages and overheads like buildings, she explained. She added, the banks are also driving the move away from branch level service to digital. For many workers in retail banking, they must meet performance targets to reduce the number of customers coming into the branches. They are trained and coached to redirect customers to ATMs and or online banking to reduce foot traffic in branches. CBA, or Commonwealth Bank of Australia, now has 875 branches compared with 1,134 in February 2020 when it trumpeted having Australia's largest branch network down from 1,192 in February 2019 before the pandemic took hold. The number of ATMs also fell from 4,118 in 2019 to 3,597 in 2020. It now says it has more than 2,000 ATMs. Last year, ANZ Head of Distribution, Kath Bray, said branch closures across the country would be inevitable in coming years as more people switch to digital transactions. And there we have it, people. Even the head of ANZ Distribution, Kath Bray, is admitting that people are going to digital transactions. Miss Bray also said some customers have been reluctant to switch back to branches. 
Despite the shrinking footprint of physical stores, Miss Bray said branches would still be vital to ANZ's network, but would be designed to deal with more complex issues such as home loans and financial hardship. Quote, we still need more branches, but fewer of them. End quote, end article. Time for Uncle Adam to freestyle the financial mic. Many people ask me when coming into the crypto land, how is money going to work if the internet drops out? And I think it's a very fair question. Now, my response to these people is that we are already using digital money. We already use digital money through tap and pay and through the reality that many bank shop fronts are closing down. We can't access these branches as they are going digital as well. We can see that banks are admitting that they push their customers into their own digital space, their centralized digital space. We can also see that if you're concerned about not having access to your money because the internet goes down, well, crypto gives us a new freedom beyond what the banks are offering us. Allow me to explain. If a government wants to seize or stop your money, they can direct a bank to do so. So in the first hand, the banks are in fact an agent to the government in the sense that they will react to the government's direction to stop your accounts. Just look at what happened in Canada as an example. And yes, that's a first world democratic nation, allegedly, that stopped the movement of money through banks following the orders of the government. Now, one way or another, we are all forced to follow the government, but in many ways, we can see that the banks are kind of agents to the governments as they lie in bed together. Banks and governments run economies and civilizations in unison. Now, while a government can direct a bank to stop the movement of your money, equally, the bank itself can stop the movement of your money on purpose or through malfunction of their own systems. That is, we know that if we go around the world, as an example, and you try and buy something and the bank says, that looks a bit dodgy, they stop the transaction to ensure that you're not being scammed. Now, on the surface, this seems pretty good. They don't want someone misusing your credit card. More importantly, they don't want to be in a position where they have to refund money that you've lost through their networks. But we can see that this control over our money can often be an abuse of power. Allow me to explain. When I first got into the crypto space and I was trying to buy crypto legitimately and legally through a recognized legal platform, the Commonwealth Bank of Australia stopped my transaction, repeatedly stopped my transaction. It was a transaction that I had authorized to another Australian company, an Australian company that was perfectly legal to buy a product that was also perfectly legal and recognized by the Australian government as something that I was allowed to buy, hold, sell and trade. Yet the Commonwealth Bank decided that they didn't want me to buy it. So now you can see that the internet didn't drop out. The government didn't direct them to stop the transaction, but the Commonwealth Bank took it upon themselves to say, we're not going to allow you to spend your money on that with our competitor, because crypto is most certainly a direct competitor to the banks. So when it comes to crypto, the risk I face is the dropping out of the internet. That is, I won't be able to move my money if the internet drops out. Now, there are, in fact, ways around this through radio networks and satellite networks, but that's for another video. The point I'd like to make here is if I'm holding my money digitally in a bank, which we already do, it can be stopped three ways. The government can say, stop it. The bank can say, stop it. Or the internet can drop out. So that's three ways that my money suddenly stops. If I'm doing it in crypto, there's only one way it can stop. So the reality is when we're using these digital spaces, we are only facing a third of the risk of not being able to access or move our money. And this is emphasized with the fact that banks are shutting down. And if the internet drops out, I can't get money out of the ATM. Let's face it, how many times have you gone to an ATM and there's been a little symbol on there that says currently out of order or something alike? Concurrently, if the internet drops out and you try and use an FPOS machine at the shops or a POS terminal, a point of sale terminal, if the internet has dropped out or for whatever reason your card isn't working, you can't access this money. Now to be clear, I'm big on cash in the sense that I have no issue with cash and I think it should be a sovereign right to use cash within an economy. It ensures privacy, freedom of association, the freedom to hold your money and a redundant analog system so you can move money around the economy. But we can see that there have already been moves to implement a cash ban. Admittedly, they started off by saying it's going to be a $10,000 limit cash ban. That is, you could use cash under $10,000, but anything over $10,000, you become a criminal. Now, we stopped that cash ban through some very good lobbying by the people to say, this is not right, this is not fair, and we stopped that bill going through. But noting the use of cash is becoming more rare, 
and access to this cash and these cash services is also becoming more rare, we really need to consider why are we paying so much money to these centralized systems that are removing their services and that we no longer need anyway? Why is it that we can only access sovereign tender through a centralized third party who ironically has the ability to print that sovereign tender in a digital form anyway? The irony of the banking sector globally is that the more efficient it becomes, the worse the service is. Think how easy it is for them to do banking now through essentially the internet and computers comparative to human labor and physical spreadsheets of the past. Yet the easier it becomes for them and the more money they make, the less access we have to their services. Equally, as the digital space rises outside of the banking sector itself with decentralized finance platforms and the new financial rails of Bitcoin and alike, we can see that these prehistoric centralized corrupt models are squeezing every last bit of profit out of you and the economy at the detriment of all of us through the endless dilution of all of our holdings. Even as their costly labor-intensive shop fronts disappear, so too are the digital ATMs, machines that are essentially doing the services for the majority of the bankers out there. That is, let's face it, in the past, most people were going into a shop front before to either withdraw or deposit cash. Even those machines are disappearing. The banks and the governments are naturally pushing us towards the digital space. And that's fine. But why do we need the centralized financial systems when we can now do it all alone? When you hold Bitcoin, you are a bank. You are a bank. You control that money. You are the operating hours. You don't need permission from a third party. No one can stop your money. No one can seize your money. And no one can dilute your money. As we can see with the conflict in Eastern Europe at the moment, even when Ukraine can access traditional financial systems, they reach out to the people for Bitcoin donations. And for anyone who thinks we must have these centralized systems so money can't move to and from bad people, remember, the number one choice of money for criminal activity is not crypto, it's the US dollar. Moreover, if you want to launder huge amounts of money, you don't do it through crypto, you do it through the banking system. That is where all the laundering is taking place. Because when you try and launder or move money through Bitcoin, you've left a digital trail. And that digital trail is very easy for law enforcement to follow. However, when you're using centralized systems such as banks who are pushing either physical fiat or digital fiat around the world, the opportunity for laundering money becomes almost limitless. And we have seen this through royal commissions and alike from around the world, where as soon as you get into the eight and nine figure mark, you're going to have more opportunity to launder money. Meanwhile, governments and banks accuse the everyday citizen making a cash transaction of doing something potentially wrong. Ultimately, we no longer need banks. We no longer need banks because the services that they provide, or used to provide, are now available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year to anyone anywhere in the world with an internet connection. We already use digital money. The question that we have to ask is, why are we using centralized digital money when we can use completely open, borderless, immutable, censorship resistant and all inclusive money available to everyone in a far more efficient way whilst avoiding the endless dilution of everyone's money through inflation caused by fractional reserve lending? I'm Adam Stokes. Thanks for listening. Happy investing. Banks are a thing of the past. And I'll talk to you next time.